So you might talk about the Internet of Things. I think about the Internet of Living Things. It's the ultimate in crowdsourcing of problem-solving, where nature's communicating, adapting and innovating all the time. I'm an engineer. I, I actually I, I won this little prize in chemistry, and I get accused of practicing chemistry without a license. Um, after all, you know, human chemists are, are pretty clever, but my inspiration comes from the chemistry of the biological world. I marvel at the chemistry of living systems because the beauty and the, the complexity of the products that it makes are inspiring, but most inspiring is the marvelous efficiency with which biology can assemble new life from renewable, abundant starting materials. And if we're to feed, clothe and house 10 billion people without destroying our natural environment, I feel we have a lot to learn from how life does that. So, I'm a chemist, sort of, I work with the chemists of the biological world, and it all comes from these marvelous molecular machines called enzymes, and these are the proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. They're DNA-encoded catalysts that make life possible. Equally awe-inspiring, however, is the process that nature uses to build and create these machines. In fact, everything else in the biological world. And that process of evolution, it's a grand diversity-generating machine, a simple algorithm of mutation and natural selection that has created all of the life we know, starting from our universal common ancestor more than three billion years ago. And so this is the living world's recipe for optimization, for adaptation and for innovation. And it's something that's really simple and can be used. Now, I wanted to engineer nature's catalyst to make something better suited for human purposes. And back then, we struggled mightily to build something useful, to encode in DNA some new biomolecule that would compete with oil, pumping oil out of the ground. And even today, we still don't know how DNA encodes biological function well enough to reliably sit down and design that. So I turned to nature's design process. Today, think about it, we have these incredible tools that allow us to read and write any DNA sequence you want. It costs less than $1,000 to sequence an entire human genome. And you can email off your favorite sequence of DNA to a supplier anywhere in the world and get back the actual physical genetic material in the mail. And of course, you've heard, it about, heard about editing DNA, for example, to correct genetic diseases. So we can read, write, edit DNA, but what can't we do? We cannot compose it, right? The code of life. It's like a Beethoven symphony. It's beautiful. It's stunningly intricate. It's the product of four billion years of evolutionary work. So we may not be able to compose like this, but evolution can. So some think of the protein universe, all the possible proteins, as the set of all the proteins that nature has explored. But all the proteins that exist today these biological molecules that exist today and all relevant to life going back to the beginning of life, those are the ones that are relevant to biology, and they're just an infinitesimal fraction of all the possible proteins. I wanted to explore these possible proteins to find ones that would serve human purposes. And think about this. This is a set that's vast, it's bigger, by many orders of magnitude than all the particles in the known universe. And this universe of the possible contains solutions to the greatest challenges of humanity. The cure to cancer is there, the solution to the energy crisis, maybe even the cure to death and taxes. <laughs> but how do you find this, right? How do you find this in this vast universe of genetic possibilities, most of which 
are perfectly useless. So the question was, how could I discover enzymes that do chemistry better than what nature has already done, that might help me make fuels and chemicals that compete with plumping oil out of the ground? So I figured out how to do this uh, more than 20 years ago. We developed an, a reliable optimization process. Basically, you have a starting point that you get from nature. You use recombination, mutation, and artificial selection with all the DNA in the test tube and programming microbes to churn out all these new proteins. And then I decide which ones start to acquire the traits that I'm interested in. Those get used to parent the next generation. So basically, what we're doing is breeding proteins, much like you breed cats and dogs. So I can use this to get useful results. And lots of useful results came out, so the methods we developed in the 1990s were adopted rapidly, making everything from, yes, the enzymes in your laundry detergents are products of my methods, because what self-respecting natural enzyme wants to work in your laundry machine? They're used for manufacturing pharmaceuticals, for diagnostics, imaging, and you heard the list. So the idea is that you can use evolution to move into the future. Let me, I'll just share a couple of practical examples that have come out of my research group at Caltech, starting with GIVO, which we founded in 2005, remember oil was $140 a barrel, to make jet fuel from renewable biomass. Rather than making ethanol, which they say is better for drinking than for driving, we actually programmed yeasts, simple ethanol yeasts, to make jet fuel precursors. And this actually works. Many airlines have flown on this in real flights. The fuel comes from the carbon dioxide and the solar energy that plants have learned how to store and collect. And it's made in a refurbished ethanol plant in Minnesota, and the waste product can be fed to farm animals. You can't make any money doing this because the price of oil has plummeted, and we're not willing to pay the real cost of burning non-renewable fuels and fossil fuels and dumping that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. You may remember that the Environmental Protection Agency under President Obama designated carbon dioxide as an environmental pollutant. So for this work, I was awarded the, the National Medal of Technology and Innovation at the White House in 2013, which was actually the only time my kids have actually been impressed with what I do. <laughs> Another startup that uh, came out of my Caltech research is interfering with insect sex. We desperately need sustainable ways to grow crops and dramatically reduce the pesticides that we're dumping out onto the planet. And it turns out you can use insects' own sex signals. This is the, the molecular plume that a female uses to attract her mates. And you can use that to confuse males. So you spray a little of her Chanel number no. five in the field, and suddenly she's everywhere. And he can't find her, and that means no babies. Completely non-toxic. So Provivi figured out how do you make these complex perfumes in large quantities so that we can actually provide them for the world's major crops. This is a pest that's devastating corn crops all over the world, the fall armyworm. And the caterpillar, so this moth, the Spadoptera frugiperida, comes from a caterpillar who has a voracious appetite that can destroy an entire crop in just a short time. And it's all over South America. A few years ago, it migrated to Africa, where it's laying waste to the maize crops in Africa and the huge quantities of pesticides that are used to battle this pest are, of course, destroying other beneficial insects and other species. Most African farmers don't have access to these pesticides, and if they do, they don't know how to safely apply them. And the inevitable resistance that comes up means that these pesticides will soon be completely ineffective anyway. And Africa doesn't use the GMO corn varieties that limit fall armyworm elsewhere. And GMOs are also losing their traits to resistance development quickly as well.
These Mexican farmers successfully reduced uh, the use of pesticides. Provivi can make these sex pheromones in ton quantities, and their first products are actually dramatically improving non-GMO corn in Mexico, where they'll actually be available next year. These farmers reduce their pesticide use and improve their crop yields when they use the pheromone sprays. And this is all chemistry done by the biological world. Can directed evolution take us to chemistry never explored in biology? I mean, the chemistry of nature is vast, but it's not unlimited. Now, here's your periodic chart for the day. Remember, you're supposed to do some new things here, so take you back to high school. Biology knows how to form bonds between carbon and a few other elements like nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, a few halogens, a few metals. But there's vast parts of this periodic table where biology never went, as far as we know. Consider silicon, second most abundant element on the Earth's crust. Yet carbon-silicon bonds are not known in biology. Humans make them. There's probably 50 products in this room, from your hair gels to your earbuds, caulks, paints, sealants, made with carbon-silicon bonds, with human chemistry, not biologies. But humans do it poorly, mining hundreds of millions of dollars of platinum catalyst to make these products. And that mining alone leads to huge environmental degradation. Yet we showed that biology can do it with earth-abundant iron activated inside of a protein. When we published this, no one read the boring chemistry paper, but the news went all over the world with the help of journalists who brought it to big audiences. You may remember this Star Trek episode where Spock and Captain Kirk are interacting with the life in rocks, the Horta episode. Well, they got it all wrong. Of course, we're not putting life in rocks. We're trying to put silicon rocks in life, but details. In any case, this story went all over the world with the help of journalists, so that by the time it made it to the UK Daily Mail, we were putting silicon chips in people's brains. But it was fun. <laughs> no one read the actual paper. <laughs> but the point is, in just two years, using these evolution methods, we were able to bring two whole new elements to the carbon, to the, the, to the chemistry of life. Silicon first in 2016 and boron in 2017. This is the sort of thing that gets chemists really excited, just to say so. And it earned me the greatest accolade of my life earlier this year when I appeared on the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> the first woman to have a cameo appearance. I now have a SAG after contract to play myself. The bad news is that the show is over. Or maybe that's the good news. Um, it's a somewhat endearing graduate students at Caltech. It started off with 12 years ago, but after 12 seasons, they become annoying professors lobbying for Nobel Prizes, and that's probably long enough. I was also invited to a rather nice party at this small house in Stockholm last December, all lit up and beautiful, but do note this picture was taken at 3.30 in the afternoon. And I did meet some nice people who tend to dress up a little bit more than we do uh, for dinner, but I got to hang out with Donna Strickland. And this is Donna Strickland is the first woman in 55 years to win the Nobel Prize in physics. And in fact, 2018 was a very special year. It was the first time in history that two women won Nobel Prizes in the sciences. None this year. <laughs> Here, Donna and I are playing with our medals, right, in this photo, and only these are the chocolate versions, because <laughs> Nobel laureates are notoriously forgetful and have been known to leave them lying about, so we don't get the actual medals until we sign a release and we're on our way home. So we had to be happy with the chocolate versions. <laughs> Evolution. It circumvents our profound ignorance of how DNA and codes function in the living world how it codes, encodes chemistry, and allows us to create new biology that solves human problems. And in nature, at least, this design process works at all scales of complexity, 
from molecules all the way up to ecosystems. If there are any engineers in the audience, you know there's nothing like that in any world of human engineering. So we have control over this amazing process. So you might talk about the Internet of Things. I think about the Internet of Living Things. It's the ultimate in crowdsourcing of problem solving, where nature is communicating, adapting, and innovating all the time. And in the biological world, all that innovation comes from the genetic diversity that's already there. Mutation and recombination of that existing diversity quickly generates solutions to your newest antibiotic, your pesticide, oil spill, and yes, nature is working on plastics. And another and last important lesson that we learned from nature, and that is, without that diversity, we are doomed to extinction, because that diversity is being used by everyone else. So with that, thank you.